Um, so, so anyway, so, um, I am a, a nurse, registered nurse. Um, I've only ever worked in maternal child health. My first job and for the first uh, seven years that I was a nurse, I worked as a labor and delivery nurse. Um, most recently was at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center here in Boston. Um, I'm also a board certified lactation consultant. And like many of you just saw on our, uh, the beginning of our call, I have three girls who are five, three, and one. Um, and I live in South Boston with my husband and my three kids. Um, but when I connected with Samantha and we were sort of like brainstorming ideas around sort of topics that we could cover, I figured that it would be great to start with like a super relevant topic for you guys, which is parenting in a pandemic, whether that is, you know, you're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant or you have young kids at home um, and sort of what talking about like what is relevant right now. And for those of you who have um, engaged either in services with us at Boston Apps or have been following us on social media or know myself and my business partner, Emily, um, we do try and like keep it pretty real. Like, yes, we have this medical side of things that, that we know, obviously being nurses, um, but we also have very much this real life perspective on things, being moms of young kids and understanding that like you really actually do sometimes just need an answer. It might not be a straightforward answer. Um, it might not be an answer that has zero risk, but being able to like talk through a lot of these scenarios and just actually feel like you have a way to either make decisions or you have reliable information to make the best decision for your family, I think can be really helpful. Um, so that's what, sort of, you know, why I thought that this would be the most relevant topic. Um, so I'd really love to be able to answer any questions for you guys that you may have around COVID or cold and flu season or COVID considerations when you're thinking about the holidays or travel or, or childcare options or seeing family or whatever the case may be. Um, I did just want to start with, because I'll probably end up referring back to this often as we talk. Um, has anybody, does anybody follow or has anybody heard of Emily Oster? Yeah. So for those of you who might not know her, I highly suggest um, following her on social media. Um, if you haven't read any of her books, she's the author of Crib Sheet and Expecting Better. She actually lives in Rhode Island as well, not too, Samantha. Um, she's an economist and the, what she has focused her work on is um, pregnant and parent topics. And so her book, Expecting Better, um, focuses on all the pregnancy related like topics and questions. And she really focuses on the research in her books, right? So the research around what you can eat during pregnancy, exercise, epidurals versus non epidurals, right? Like she talks about all this like pregnancy and labor and birth stuff. And then in her book, Crib Sheet, um, she talks about all the data and research around like all these parenting decisions, right? Like to circumcise or not circumcise, breastfeed or bottle feed, um, Montessori school or traditional education. Like she goes through like all these decisions. So she is somebody who I've been following for a very long time. Um, I have read her books, but when COVID happened, um, she was one of the first people to sort of like take on writing about it, looking at the research, and it kind of accidentally, like she would tell you, like she did not want to take this on as like a research project, but nobody else was. Um, so she sort of like accidentally ended up taking on um, creating systems to collect data around coronavirus, specifically related to daycares, childcare centers, and schools. And she's actually pro um, having schools open. Um, but her newsletter has been, and you can sign up for a newsletter. She sends out newsletters like twice a week. Um, one on like parenting, pregnancy, education, the other one right now on coronavirus. Um, but her newsletters are one of the only things that I'm sort of like allowing in right now as a source of information, right? I think we can all probably relate to as a parent and even more so now as a parent during a pandemic, relate to getting information from a bunch of different sources. Um, and then like almost trying to like filter through all that information to figure out what is the right decision for you, right? So I feel like it starts like as soon as you get pregnant, right? Like everybody has an opinion, everybody has advice, everybody wants to tell you the best thing that they have or the best thing that you need to do or you know this referral is the person who you need to see, right? So everybody has their opinions. Um, so it starts really early on in this parenting journey of 
all this information that you're sort of receiving. And you actually have to get, if you haven't, if you're not already good at it, you have to get really good at filtering like the information that you can receive. And I feel like that filter is really important right now, right? Because if we take in all of the sources of information that we can get right now related to coronavirus, it's coming from everywhere, right? Social media, listening, overhearing people, you know, walking down the sidewalk or in the grocery store, the news, um, your spouse, um, podcast. I mean, it's everywhere. You, you can't do anything without hearing about coronavirus, right? Um, and so I think that there really needs to be like a very intentional filter to the information that you're willing to receive, that you're willing to listen to, um, knowing that it's coming from a source that that you trust, right? That you want to hear information from. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to like think about when we're thinking about one, our mental health during all of this, right? Like we can't possibly listen to all of the information from all the different places. Otherwise we're going to continue in this loop of feeling like overwhelmed and anxious, right? Um, so, so there's a huge piece of it related to our mental health. And then there's also just this piece of it where it's like, you do actually have to filter some of this information in order to start making some decisions. Um, so through this filter for myself, I have really landed on, and I don't only, you know, read and listen to Emily Oster, right. But, um, but I have landed on like using her as a pretty reliable source of information, mainly because she, she's an economist, right. So it comes from a place of data and that I actually really like. Right. But one of the things that she has put out there is this decision making process related to making a decision when we don't have really good data. Right. Now, the data is getting better, but still like pretty limited. Right. Um, and so her decision making process, just to go through this quickly for you guys before I start answering questions, um, includes a process that is slightly different from her books. Her books have start with the research. What does the research say? Right. Does the research tell you there's one right, you know, there's one right way to do this? Okay, so the research related to coronavirus is obviously that there's no way that you can do this without any risk, right? So like, how do we actually make a decision here? So the first thing that she starts with is framing the question. And what she means by framing the question is like, what are the two, like, what are the things that you're actually considering, right? Not all of the possible things that you're considering. What are the two things that you're considering? So a conversation that we have with clients often is we're trying to decide what to do about childcare right? Do we have a nanny? Do we go to daycare? Do we have a family member watch um, our child? Do my partner and I try and figure out how to manage working from home and splitting the responsibilities, right? Like I just laid out four scenarios. Well, well, what are you actually choosing between, right? Like, so you're throwing daycare out there as an option, but are you comfortable with daycare? Like you're throwing it out there as if it's an option, but that might not even be something that you're even comfortable with at all, right? Or you're throwing you and your partner um, you know, splitting responsibility. Is that even an option at all? Is that even a viable option, right? So get really clear around what the choices are that you're actually willing to consider, right? Um, it's also really important to think about if this is even a decision that you need to make right now, right? So Emily and I were talking, Emily Silver, my business partner, not Oster, although I have done some Q and A's with Emily Oster. Um, she's amazing by the way. Um, but Emily Silver and I in the spring, we're talking to a lot of parents who were asking us what to do about sending their kid to school in the fall. And it was like, I know that you want to make that decision right now, but you actually can't, right? Because there, we have no idea what's gonna, what, what it's gonna, what schools are gonna look like in the fall, right? Like this decision might be made for you, right? Um, so it's even, you know, step one is, is this even a decision that you have to make, that you have to make right now, or is this just a decision that you want to make right now, right? And then two is, what, what, are, what are you actually considering? What are your actual options, right? Um, so I love just that first step, because I actually think that it helps people get really clear. Like, there are some people who are like, huh, when I actually, like, narrow down my options, there's only one, right? Like, there's only one viable option. So I think it can be really helpful to just, like, frame the question, right? Then once you sort of, if, if you're not left with one option, after you sort of decide what it is you've been considering, so let's say you have these two options. Like let's say you're deciding between a daycare and um, a nanny, right? Well, then you have to look at both scenarios and say, well, how can I mitigate risk? So we're just trying to mitigate risk, right? Because there's no way to eliminate risk. And you guys, this isn't new to parenting, right? 
everything that we do in life, everything that we do to, as a parent comes with risk. There's just some inherent risk that we're willing to take on that we don't think about all the time, right? Like driving with our kids, like sending our kids to daycare or schools during flu season right? Like these things aren't usually on the forefront of our mind in the decision-making process, but coronavirus is. So also like put it in the context of like, well, what other risks am I taking that I'm also just like inherently taking and not thinking about, right? Um, so how, but, but in this scenario, how can you mitigate the risk, right? Is it, um, you know, that the childcare provider, you know, in the daycares, like what are their protocols for mitigating risk? right? Are they wearing masks the entire time, right? Which most childcare centers are. Um, if you're thinking about a nanny, like how can you mitigate risk? Maybe you're really clear on where the, your childcare provider can take your child, right? Like you're not going to go on play dates, but maybe you're okay with them um, going outside to a park, right? And, and, you know, running around at a park or something like that, right? Like how can you actually mitigate the risk? So think about, ways that you can mitigate risk. And then, I, and then step three is in her decision-making process is evaluate the actual risk. And I think this is really important, especially as it relates to children, right? The, the, the actual risk to children is pretty low for coronavirus, right? The risk of serious illness to children is low, okay? Um, and, and that's, that's, you know, again, not to say that it, there isn't some risk that maybe you're taking on as their parent, or maybe that you have grandparents that you see, right? But who are you actually evaluating the actual risk for? Is it for your child? Is it for you? Is it for a grandparent, right? But, but actually look at the actual risk. What's the actual risk to your child, to you, to, you know, anybody who your child might be around? The next step, and one that I don't want anybody to glaze over, is you also have to evaluate the benefits and, and when you're evaluating the benefits, you have to include your mental and emotional health, right? So again, using an example that, that Emily and I get asked often, it's I have a newborn at home and I am not okay. Like I am mentally in a really bad place because I haven't had any help. And I don't know how to decide if I should have somebody come in and help me right? Whether that's a family member or a friend or a professional company, like how do I make that decision? Well, what are the risks, right? How can you mitigate the risks? And what are the actual risks of them coming into your home? And how does that compare to the benefit? The benefit being your physical and mental health, right? Um, so don't, don't skip over the step. Don't skip over the step of what the benefit would be for your mental health, what the benefit would be to your work, what the benefit would be to your relationship with your spouse, right? Like think about the, what would the benefit be to your child, right? If you're thinking about a daycare or school and your child socializing, right? So don't glaze over that. And then step five is make a decision. You have to make a decision, right? Otherwise you're stuck in this loop of indecision and anxiety and stress and feeling overwhelmed all the time, right? And you're not moving because you're not making any choices. You have to make a choice, right? And know that you're making the choice not without any risk, but, but knowing that you have framed the question, you've evaluated your risk, you're mitigating your risk, you know what the benefits are, and that this is, you're making the best decision that you can given the information that you have, right? And if new information comes up, you guys can always change, change your decision, right? Or if something changes, you change your mind. Um, but you have to just make a choice and move. Um, so anyway, so I like to just like start with, that framework, because I think it can be really helpful in making some of these decisions. Um, at least I have found it really helpful and I've used it a lot with our clients. Um, and I can send you guys, if you want as a follow-up, I can send it to Samantha, but you guys, I can send you the um, link to the newsletter that I'm referring to, just so that if you guys, I refer back to it often, just so that if you guys want to refer back to it, just to see, um, you know, to see her framework for, for this decision-making process, I think it can be really helpful. Um, that being said, I want to just like shut up for a minute and, um, actually, if you guys are okay with it, I would actually love to just like have some questions and be able to sort of go back and forth with you guys and interact with you guys live. If you guys are cool with doing some live questions, does that sound like a good plan to you? And I can take some, like, if you guys don't feel comfortable coming on live, like seriously, feel free to just throw them into the chat. And I know some people sent in questions ahead of time too. Um, but I would love to. I like interacting with people, even if it's over Zoom. So I'd love to just answer question for you, questions for you guys live, if that works. Yeah, does anybody want to? I have a question. Yeah. 
Um, so my name's Amanda. I actually used to live in Charlestown, and so I know you guys well. Um, my question, though, is, you know, as we get into flu and cold season, my son is in daycare. He's very prone to colds, as I'm sure any, you know, little one is. He's about two. Um, how do we know when to kind of take the next step and get him someone, you know, the baby tested for COVID versus kind of thinking like, all right, this is probably just a cold because the symptoms are often so similar. Yeah. So this is definitely something where like, you're just going to be having a conversation with your provider, your pediatric provider often. Right. And every pe pediatric provider is like slightly different in how they're handling, um, how they're handling symptoms. But I would say most providers are saying like, okay, do they have like a runny nose and a cough and a fever? You know, the answer is probably going to be yes. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, if that continues for more than 24 or 48 hours, then maybe we'll have them come in for a test. Okay. But if it's only, you know, 24 or 48 hours and symptoms resolve in that time, likely not related to coronavirus. Right. Um, there are some, there are some pediatricians who will say, you know what, well, let's just get you tested. Um, because you, you know, your child does have some symptoms. It really just depends on the provider. It also depends on the policies of like of childcare providers too. Like if you have a child in daycare or in yeah. school, you're probably going to have to get a test in order to go back or at least a physician note saying like, I actually know this child and know that it's allergies. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's absolutely going to be a, a back and forth conversation with your provider based on what their, um, you know, sort of what their policies are and what, what, and knowing your child. Um, and then also maybe like what policies are related to, if you, if you're using, you know, any childcare or schooling or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. What else you guys got? Hi, Jamie. Um, my name is Stephanie. Thanks so much for doing this call today. Oh, gosh, no problem. Um, so uh, my 14 month old daughter is in daycare. We made the decision um, about three months ago and we've been really lucky so far. She has stayed healthy. But um, I guess my question is we talked about mitigating risk. So are there any like, I guess I'm looking for like tips and tricks here to mitigate the risks at home. Like I don't know. So we check her temperature all the time, like changing clothes, right? When you get home, just like things we can do at home to feel more in control since we aren't at all. In fact, I have a cold today and I just went and got tested for COVID because I'm freaking out and it out is negative. But um, yeah, I guess just like, what can we do at home? The only place that we have control over, um, assuming, you know, we're being careful out in the social aspects, but grocery stores and whatnot, like, yeah. Other than the obvious wearing a mask and washing hands, I guess. Yeah, honestly, hand washing. I know that that's like not what people like want to hear because I know it just gets like shoved down our throats, but that is the number one way to protect yourself and protect your children is regular hand washing, right? And we're actually learning as time goes on that coronavirus really isn't living on surfaces for as long as we originally thought. Um, so things like clothes or counters or boxes, right, where people were like wiping things down all the time, it's actually not living on services for that long, right? So if you're washing your hands regularly, that's truly the best way to mitigate risk. Um, and then, yeah, wearing masks anytime that you're, you know, out in public or, you know, within six feet of other people or anything like that. But that, I know, you know, I know that that's hard, right? Like, I know that they, I know you wish that there were more things that you can be doing, but that truly is the best way to limit risk. Good. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, it's <laughs> fine. You. Yep. Caitlin, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm a big fan of you guys when I lived in the city. Um, Emily helped me out a lot. She came to my house. My son was like four months old. Yeah, and worked with us before. Um, so baby number two is due in February. Congratulations. Thank you. I have a two-year-old at home. I have a plan C section for various reasons from previous birth. Um, how are the hospitals? And I'm nervous about bringing COVID home to my mom, who's going to be like watching my son, you know, while we're in the hospital and stuff. Cause it obviously like we're on a pretty tight lockdown. Now my husband's working from home. Like my mom comes and helps out. Like she's kind of on lockdown so she can come still see us and come see my son and all of that. But I haven't heard anything of like, I haven't heard much about updating the hospital. My OB just is like, we're good. We're fine. But I wanted to know yeah. your experience. 
Yeah. So hospitals have actually, and especially OB units, right? Where this isn't like a high risk unit for coronavirus. Like if people, they're testing everybody when you come in. Um, some hospitals are actually testing your partner as well. Um, yeah, I'll be delivering it to Israel. Okay. Yep. Um, and so, so that like, that's sort of like step one, like you're getting tested either before you come to labor and delivery, especially for like a scheduled C-section or once you arrive. Um, so you get results while you're there. Um, all the nurses are wearing gloves and masks and, you know, oftentimes like a hair covering for their entire shifts. Um, if there is a patient who uh, does test positive for coronavirus, like they know either when they're coming in or once they're in the hospital, um, only one nurse is responsible for taking care of that patient. Um, so it's not like one nurse who's taking care of a patient with coronavirus is also taking care of two or three other patients who, have, who don't have coronavirus, right? Um, so just mitigating risk that way. Um, there has not been any major issues with coronavirus in terms of spread going into the hospital and get, you know, and coming home with it, um, especially on the labor and delivery units, because it's a locked unit, like nobody can come on and off that unit without, a, without permission to be there, right, without like a badge just to swipe on and off. Um, so if they don't have, you know, in terms of medical staff, visitors, if they don't have permission to be there, they're not coming. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and then again, like if we're talking about mitigating risks, nurses are wearing masks, nurses, physicians, anesthesia, everybody's wearing a mask their entire shift. Everybody's washing their hands constantly. Everybody has gloves on anytime that, are, that they're coming in contact with you. So the actual risk of being in the hospital is pretty low. Yeah. Are your parents yeah. going to be there? They're going like they're with you or they'll be there? No, just my husband's going to be in the hospital with me. And then my mom's just going to be at my house watching my son while we're because we'll be there because we'll do the four days. And then um, she'll be there. She'll be in our house for a couple of days when we first come home. Gotcha. Yeah. So you'll have you, you'll have a test when you're there. Um, so that that alone might be really reassuring for you when you actually come home. Um, but yeah, like the risk of actually contracting at the hospital, very low. Thank you. You're welcome. Alicia, did you have a question? Hi, piggybacking on that a little bit. Um, so I actually am due with my first child in um, January. Congrats. So pretty soon. <laughs> um, and in a it, kind of piggybacking on the hospital situation. Um, I mean, obviously I don't plan on getting coronavirus. I don't know that anybody does, but I do know that they're testing as people are coming in both, you know, the patient and, and, um, you know, like my support person. Yep. Um, what happens if we do test positive? Um, I guess I've heard some horror stories about like them potentially like taking, like removing you from the baby from you or things like that. And, I just think I will we'll lose my mind if that happens, yeah. <laughs> you so know, kind that, of like, what are some rights around it that I could research or know yeah. prior to going into this? Yep. Are you delivering here in Boston? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, the, when, when coronavirus originally uh, started, we didn't have a lot of data and information on it. We weren't sure if it was transferred, you know, through, uh, on surfaces or through breast milk. Um, there was a, there, the hospitals had talked about a period of separation for mom and baby if mom tested positive. That is no longer the case anymore. That's not even the recommendation anymore. So both the CDC and the AAP put out statements saying that you shouldn't separate moms and babies. Um, and so, and, but your rights around it are, it's actually a choice. So like if somebody did say, you know, you need to be separated from your baby because you tested positive, it would be at the mother's discretion to make that choice. Um, so okay. you would have to say, I'm okay with that. And then that choice would be made for you. But otherwise they're actually keeping you together. They're keeping you in the room, you, your partner and the baby all in the room together. Um, and no, you guys aren't, nobody's allowed to leave the room. Um, you know, they'll, if you need anything, they have to bring it to you. There's no like going in and out of, you know, the hospital in terms of like going home and coming back and things like that. Um, but they're actually not separating moms and babies anymore. That was like for a very short period of time in at the end of March. And that it, that got the kibosh like pretty quickly. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good question. What else you guys? I can pull up some of the questions that people sent in if nobody else has anything for me right now. Okay, cool. Do you guys want me to pull up some of the questions and I can just like rapid fire answer these? Okay, awesome. All right, so I have my 13 month old is in daycare, what are the risks? Um, so when we're thinking about, again, young children, uh, children in general, 
um, are, are at a very, very low risk. When you're thinking about daycares, again, if we're thinking about this as like, what are the risks? Obviously, I know that you're asking like, what are the risks of, of your child correct, contracting coronavirus, right? Um, so what is the child care center doing to, to mitigate risk? Most child care centers, checking temperatures, doing screening when you show up, all child care providers are wearing masks, all child care providers are washing hands, they're sanitizing um, the stations and the space constantly throughout the day. Um, what, you know, what kind of products are they using is a good question. What company do they have coming in doing the sanitization? Like these are all really good questions. Um, but, but with especially like daycare providers where the regulation, they're pretty well regulated in order, they've been well regulated in order to open back up, the risks are pretty low when you're thinking about the, you know, what they're doing to mitigate the risk. And also that children in general are just in a pretty low, low uh, risk category. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. And again, go back to the idea of like, no matter what you're doing as a parent, I'm not, I'm not this is not a scare tactic, but I'm not saying this to scare you at all. I'm just saying like, no matter what you do as a parent, no matter what you do in life, it comes with some inherent risks that we're not thinking about, right? Like we're not consciously thinking about. Um, so just know that, you know, the same things that you're going to do to protect your kids during flu season, right? Like washing hands constantly, not letting, you know, people visit when your child is sick, not sending your child to um, daycare or school when they're sick. These are all ways that on your end, you can be mitigating the risk as well, right? Um, another question is, my child is one month old and we have kept our bubble tight, but I want to make sure we're doing everything we can. So yeah, I mean, when we're thinking about newborn babies, um, there are things, again, like, not to sound like a broken record here, right? But the best way to keep like your baby and child safe, wash hands. Um, don't let anybody come over who has any sort of symptoms, flu-like symptoms, fever, cough, runny nose. They're just, they don't come visit. Like that's easy, right? Um, with newborns prior to, like things that I'm actually worried about related to newborns, right? Um, are things like flu, right? Um, respiratory illnesses can be, um, can be really impactful on kids. Again, coronavirus, but we're also talking about things like pneumonia. Um, we're thinking about kids, you know, under the age of two months, if they get a fever, then they have to, they need to go to the emergency room and they have to have this full workup. Um, my third daughter had a fever when she was six weeks old. Full workup is pretty terrible. You know, it's blood, it's urine, it's a spinal tap. Um, so, so we're really actually trying to just avoid like any illness in a child that's two months and younger before their first set of vaccines, right? They usually get it eight weeks. Um, so are there things that you can be doing to mitigate risk of a newborn? And there are things that you can do, right? Hand washing, obviously not letting anybody come over who's sick. If somebody does come over and visit, maybe you do have them wear a mask, right? Um, that's actually not a totally unreasonable request for somebody who's coming, just coming for a visit. Um, isn't somebody who's going to be like a regular care provider, right? If a regular care provider is in your home pretty regularly, they don't need to be wearing a mask. Um, but if it's somebody just coming for a visit, maybe you do ask them to wear a mask. Um, you can ask people, child care providers, people coming to visit, maybe you don't have anybody to come to visit who hasn't gotten a flu vaccine or who hasn't gotten their Tdap. Their Tdap, um, you know, that stands for tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, right? The big thing with um, um, newborns is the pertussis piece because that can make, it's a respiratory disease that can make kids really sick. Um, so if they don't have those vaccines, then maybe don't, they don't come and visit until your child has gotten their two month vaccines, right? So those are actually things that you can do for a newborn baby less than two months old before their first set of vaccines that I think are pretty reasonable requests when you're thinking about visitors. If it's, you may decide that you just don't want visitors to come, um, you know, before two months, you might still, have help, right? But but maybe not like actual visitors come, or you might ask them to sort of um, do these things, right? Wash their hands, wear a mask, make sure that they have like flu and Tdap. And if they're not willing to do that, then maybe they just can't come and visit right now, right? Like you're allowed to set boundaries with people because it's your family and it's your kid. So like, don't feel bad about doing that. You're just trying to make the best decisions for your family. And if you're setting a boundary and it feels good for you to set that boundary and it pisses the other person off, it was probably a boundary that needed to be set anyway, right? Um, like if they're gonna get that pissed off about it, they probably didn't need to be coming around anyway. Um, so don't be afraid to like set boundaries, make requests um, and just and make decisions based on what's best for you and your family. But that's, that's when I'm thinking about those really young babies, that's what I'm thinking about, right? Like I would hate for, and it doesn't matter the source of the fever. Like I would hate for a newborn to, it's, it's terrible. Like I went through it. Like I would hate for a newborn to end up in the hospital with a fever 
not related, you know, to coronavirus, but needing to get this like full workup because it's awful. Um, any questions that you guys are thinking of as I'm talking, please just feel free to like unmute yourself and ask, but otherwise I'll just sort of like start running through some of these questions still. Um, discerning the difference between cold and COVID, I think we touched on that, especially like with like these older kids, right? That like my youngest is like this, she's 18 months old. Um, or 20 months old, I guess now. You can't keep track. The poor third child. I just never know how old she is. It was like I never knew how far along in my pregnancy I ever was. Um, but um, but like there, you know, there's you have the, if you have more than one kid at home, like you have that kid who sort of like always has the runny nose or the cough, and it's like, Jesus, like what how am I gonna handle this? You know? Um, but really, like I think we sort of touched on this. I think like if symptoms persist, if they worsen. If the conversation with your pediatrician is, oh, like this isn't a kid who usually gets sick or, you know, they're going to daycare or school, like let's actually have you tested sooner rather than later. So definitely just this is a time when, you know, you need to just check in with your child care. I mean, your, um, your pediatrician uh, provider regularly on those. Um, I'm pregnant and worried about COVID while pregnant and once baby arrives in March. So the sort of like data and research, um, the CDC actually just re released another research study, um, maybe like two or three weeks ago related to pregnancy and coronavirus. Um, but basically like the data that we're, the information that we're getting related to pregnancy and coronavirus um, is sort of this, it's the same, right? Like it's just validating sort of what we already knew, which is that pregnancy makes you slightly more susceptible to serious illness, right? And this is with any virus right? This is with the flu. This is with coronavirus, right? So it makes you more susceptible because of a slight decrease in your immune response during pregnancy. So it makes you slightly more susceptible, susceptible to serious illness, okay? So the studies that we have related to pregnancy and coronavirus have mostly been people who tested positive and were symptomatic right? So what we're finding is pregnant women who tested positive and were symptomatic fall into a category of more serious illness than, um, than the pregnant population that tested positive but was asymptomatic, right? So if you end up being exposed and having symptoms, it's more likely, still pretty unlikely, but more likely that you'd have more serious symptoms, more, you know, more serious outcome. Um, so that's what we know about pregnancy. And then again, for babies, babies are actually pretty resilient, even, even more so after that, you know, the first two months in there, um, for a set of vaccines. Um, so again, in terms of like mitigating risk and protecting your newborn, maybe think about some of the things that I just mentioned. Um, but in general, kids are in a, in a very low risk category. Um, and so it really is just about mitigating risk through, you know, hand washing, wearing masks, mitigating your own risk, maybe limiting visitors. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, one of the, one of the next questions on here is like, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I have a two week old, this is, it. I have a two week old and we're very nervous to have her out even for walks. Um, we're also hesitant to allow visitors beyond her, beyond her grandparents. What are, what is your guidance on allowing visitors? So again, like I know we touched on the visitor piece, but, but, but this is a scenario where when we're talking about taking your newborn for a walk, right? Or any, any, any child for a walk, what is the benefit to you, right? To your physical health, to your mental health, to your child, depending on their age, their child, your child's physical health or mental health to go outside and get fresh air, right? And maybe run around. But with a newborn at home, it's really the benefit to you and the benefit to you to get outside, get some fresh air, be out in the sunlight, even if it's cold outside, even if it's just a 10 minute walk around the block or up to you know your favorite coffee shop where your partner goes inside and grabs you the coffee, right? The benefits to you far outweigh the very, very, very limited risk that there is to you or your baby going out for a walk. Like going out for a walk with, with a child of any age is very low risk. Right. So I really want you, you know, when you're thinking about being home with a newborn or, or you know, any child, age children, like going out for a walk, very low risk, but has huge benefits for you, huge benefits for your kids. Okay. Um, Jamie, on yeah. that note, sorry yes. to interrupt. I, totally I, I love hearing that because we've been doing that since the beginning. One thing obviously we haven't been doing is bringing Camry, Kimmy anywhere, like, um, obviously the grocery store, home goods, like places that we've started 
going now or over the summer when things started to loosen up a little bit. Um, and now it seems like we're entering into a bit of a second surge. I don't know if it's like officially being called a second surge yeah. or not yet, but I think I know the answer to this, like still strongly recommended not to bring um, babies of any age to these places. I go to the grocery store and I see some kids wearing older ones who can wear masks. I see some babies and I'm like, maybe those moms don't have an option to not bring them, but I'm like, what's the, what's the professional recommendation still around that? Like in terms of minus 14 months, 14 months. Um, I get like, if it's a, we don't have to bring her situation, but like that's right. Like that's, that's essentially it. Right. Like I I will fully tell you guys, like I brought my five-year-old to the grocery store or like to home goods with me. Um, because she'll, she will wear a mask and she will wash her hands. Totally. Yeah. So it's also like, you know, your child best in the sense of like, can, you know, 14 months is obviously very young to be wearing a mask. The recommendation is for kids like two and older, if they'll do it. Um, so yeah, like if it's a scenario, it's like, you don't have to do it again. It's probably pretty, pretty low risk, especially if you can like have her wash her hands and not touch her face. Um, but if you don't have to do it, then like the slight risk that you would be taking on, I don't know if it's like, what's the benefit, I guess. Like, what are we weighing the benefit of, of like, it's just an outing for you. Well, in that scenario, then like, maybe you can actually let her run around at a park and not even necessarily playground. Right. But maybe you can let her like run around at a park instead you know, and play with a ball or whatever. Right. Um, not that she's going to like run around kicking a ball at 14 months, but you know what I mean? Um, are there other ways that she can like burn off energy? That's actually like less risky and more effective than, you know, going to a grocery store. Yeah. I think she just would have been really cute in a shopping cart, but I'm willing to let that go for a few more months, I think. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, like it's a really frigging good excuse to leave the house with no kids. Like, Ooh, got to go to the grocery store. Right. Yeah. That's true. I have to go by myself. That really stinks. (laughs) Oh, Target. Mm, I guess I'll go. I don't know. Get my Starbucks. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. That's what I thought. It's just like, I kind of feel like the need to remind myself this every couple of months, like the need to, or the want to do it hasn't really changed the reality of the situation. Guys, it's so hard, right? Like we're all, we've up until this point, we kind of like can make decisions whenever we feel like it. Like, even if we don't need to, we still kind of can, or we can think about it or fantasize about it or like, what would it be like to be able to do these things? But like, you just, there are just some decisions that you can't, you just can't make right now. And that's okay. Um, but it's definitely recognizing like, is, is this a decision that I want to make right now or that I need to make right now? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have another, does anybody have Jean, uh, I have another question kind of going along with that. So for those who are like pregnant with their first and I have another one coming up and, you know, surviving like that postpartum, like that fourth trimester I relied heavily on being able to leave the house and, you know, it's February and March and obviously we can't go anywhere. And, you know, I know you guys have like virtual groups that I definitely hope to take advantage of, but, you know, how else can we manage our mental health during like, probably, you know, at least for me, it was like way more difficult than pregnancy that fourth trimester like figuring everything out on top of with another kid and you know like what other resources do we have for our mental health and also staying COVID safe yeah so this is really fucking hard like yeah I mean I feel for all the moms out there I really feel for the moms who are home in a pandemic with a newborn and an older child especially those women who like schools and daycares like shut down as they were like having their second or third child, right? Um, It's hard, it's really hard. And I think that there are a couple different things that you can think about or ways that you can look at getting help. It's just gonna look a little bit different than it did before. Um, One is like definitely connect with other moms, whether that's through a group, whether that's there is um, somebody in your neighborhood or a family member who you can get together and go for a walk with. You know, I know that it's going to be cold, but like I, I, all of my kids were born in the winter time. My first was born in February of 2015 when we got like the 90 inches of snow. I could not use a fucking stroller in the city until like April. I'm not kidding you guys. Um, so my 
like go-to was I would put her in like the Catan or the Bjorn. I still had my maternity winter coat. I would zip my maternity when I would zip her into my maternity winter coat. We would go up, we would walk to the coffee shop or take the dog for a walk. Um, so, so I know that it's cold, but like you can actually still take your child for a walk safely. Um, and so I like, if, if there is a friend that you can go for a walk with, um, you know, whether they have a baby or not, like I would totally do that and just zip the baby in or, you know, put them in their little cocoon in the car seat. Even if it's just for 10 or 15 minutes, you can take a baby out in the cold for 10 or 15 minutes for a walk. They'll be totally fine. Um, and that is a really low risk, really low risk way with a uh, low, low risk activity with a very high benefit for you, right? Um, so, so think about locally, if there's somebody who you can connect with, um, and maybe it's just something that's like on the calendar, like once a week on Mondays, you know, at 11 AM, like we're just going to go for a 10 minute walk. Right. Um, so it gives you something to look forward to. Same with a group. Like if you join a group, right. Um, you know, if it is something where it like runs for a series or it meets regularly, it gives you something to look forward to. Um, that's what it is, right. It's like giving you something to look forward to giving, making you feel like you have a way to connect. Right. And then the other piece of it, right? So this is like thinking about how you can still actually have that connection and doing it in just a lower risk risk way, right? The other piece of this too is like, how can you make some decisions around asking for help or outsourcing things, right? Like I, if you guys know me at all, I'm like a very big fan of outsourcing things, um, especially as it relates to like one, like shit that I don't wanna be doing. Um, and two, like around like having kids and how like I actually don't have to do everything. Like there are other people who can help me. Um, and so what does that look like, right? Um, you know, you can outsource grocery shopping. Like I have an Instacart delivery every Sunday with the same shit that we need in our house every single week. Um, and that's really helpful, right? Like then I don't have to go to the grocery store. That's not time that I have to figure that out. I can plan out our meals for the week, like on Sunday while I'm sitting here looking at what my options are, right? One of the things that I really liked postpartum that I did was I actually outsourced, um, for like six weeks postpartum, I had this woman local, I'm happy to give you her name. Her name's Courtney. She, um, her company's Pearl Plates. Um, but I had her delivering food to my house. She would deliver food every Tuesday morning. She would deliver like a salad, mm, two or three entrees and a couple sides. And it was just like, it took enough off of my plate where then I then only had to like figure out dinner, maybe another like two nights a week, two or three nights a week, or maybe we ordered, you know, out one night, but it was a nice option of outsourcing the, the trying to plan a meal when I had, you know, two older kids at home and a newborn. And I really wanted to make dinner, but I actually like was not my best self at 5 PM, right. With a newborn, <laughs> nobody's their best self at 5 PM, but, but I was just like, I was, I was trying to make it work and it wasn't working. Right. And I only had to do it for a few weeks, but it was a really good option between like trying to make it work and feeling overwhelmed and also like spending at a ridiculous amount of money on takeout every night, right? Like it was a happy medium. Um, other things that you can outsource, like if you do allow visitors or like you were saying, you know, your mom's gonna be there. Um, when somebody comes to visit, can they bring food or can they load or unload the dishwasher or can they fold a little laundry for you, right? Um, maybe talking to your partner about how you can sort of like split up tasks in the house because in preparation for like feeling really overwhelmed with, being limited with what you can do and also like having to keep another human being alive, right? Um, just a small task. Um, but, but think about like outsourcing in those ways, right? Like what can other people be doing for you that would have the maximum impact and benefit for you in a situation where you, it's gonna be a lot on your mental load, right? So how can you like start picking you have your mental load. How can you start taking some of those things out of that load and putting it into somebody else's bucket to carry around for a few weeks or a few months or forever? Like, you know, you might like it so much, you'll do it forever. Um, but I think those are like two areas that you really can think about it. How can you stay connected? How can you ask for help, delegate tasks, outsource things? Um, and I think that will really help keep, it's not going to be perfectly balanced because it never is, right? But that'll help keep a little bit of the balance for you. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I have um, another. Yeah, go ahead, Amanda. Sorry, Jamie. Um, yeah. So if we have made the decision to travel via um, plane, you know, for the holidays, how can we kind of um, 
feel okay with that decision and not just be totally freaking out, um, you know, that we're putting our whole family in, in danger. Yeah. So I would think about, so how old are, you have kids? I have, yeah, 26 month old. Okay. Um, okay. So, so a couple things to think about. One is, um, where you're traveling from. So obviously like where in Massachusetts you're traveling from and where you're traveling to, like, those are two good things to consider in terms of like, what's going on with the numbers where we're at and what's going on with the numbers that you're traveling to, right? Like that's evaluating risk. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that can be really helpful if you're going, where are you going? Miami. Okay. Okay. So, so that's, so think My about it, there, yeah. right? Like what, what are you comfortable with taking on as a risk? Right. And then what are the people who you're going to visit comfortable taking on as a risk, you know, with you coming from Boston? So I would think less about it as like risk of trap, like the risk that you're taking on from just the travel, right? Okay. And actually think about it as like where you're going, where you're coming from. When you actually do travel, will you wear a kid, wear a mask? Uh, for very short periods. I mean, like when we go down there, my parents have been very careful. We're just basically at the house the whole time. We're not going out, not going out to dinner, like we stay by the pool and just basically veg out at home. And you're flying down there, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 So, so, you know, you'll, you'll be wearing a mask in the airport. Your partner yeah. will be wearing a mask in the airport. If your kid will wear a mask, then yeah. do it. But if, if putting a mask on makes your child touch their face more, that completely defeats the purpose. Don't okay. wear the mask. Just do tons of hand washing, right? Yeah. So hand sanitizer, yeah. you know, disinfecting wipes. When you get on the plane, wipe down the surfaces. Okay. When you get off the plane, wash your hands again. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you get into the house, wash your hands again, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to be wearing a mask the entire time. So you're just yep. thinking about mitigating the risk when you're actually traveling. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could like, again, these are just things to consider. This is not, I'm not saying that this is what you need to do, but you could get a test before you leave. You could get yes. a test when you get there. Yep. Um, those are things that you could consider yep. in terms of mitigating risk for the for the people who you're visiting too, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a, you know, I like to tell people, it's also usually a convert, like in the context of, you're trying to make this, this, this decision with another adult person who hopefully you can have a rational conversation with of like, what are you, you know, what risks are you willing to take on? And is there anything that you want us to do to help mitigate the risk for you? Um, so mm -hmm. if there is anything that your parents, you know, would want you to do or asking, like, I think it's also totally appropriate to just ask them how they're feeling and thinking. Okay. All right. But, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Fine to travel. Lots of hand washing. Yep. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Anything else you guys? All right. I was going to say there's a comment in the chat, Jamie. Um, is it possible to share the info again of the woman who prepared? Oh, yeah. You know what? So Samantha, can I actually just send you a couple links mm -hmm. after, um, sure. after this? So I'll send you guys the link to the Emily Oster newsletter. I'll send you guys the link to um, Courtney from Pearl Plates. I, I love her. She actually delivered food this week because I was like, I don't really know if I feel like cooking before the week before Thanksgiving. I'll just have Courtney deliver some food. And she sends out the menu like every Saturday. So I always like look at the menu too, to decide if like there are some really delicious things on the menu that I want. Um, but yeah, I'll send you guys her information. Okay. She's awesome. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay. Any, uh, okay. Um, I'm a pediatrician in terms of air travel and I'll also recommend eye protection. That's great. Thank you, Caroline. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I'm trying to see childcare. We already talked about that. Keeping toddlers socialized with being without being too risky. Like, this is a great question. Is anybody else like thinking about this right now? Like the socialization of toddlers? So what we, what we had, what we did with my son is, um, we made a decision with another family locally who has a daughter the same age that we used to do like local classes with and like library time with before and stuff. And we bought like a $30 homeschool preschool. It's like very loosely structured playtime. Um, and we made the decision to actually forego seeing a lot of other people and cut a lot of other people out of our circle so the kids can see each other. And we really like the family and we're good friends with them. Um, but it's paid off because when, from like March, I was in Utah for about a month, Sam was there a bit. Um, and then when we came back and everything was shut down, he like kind of stopped talking and like really got shy. And then when things opened back up and we kind of 
came to this arrangement with this other family and he sees his little buddy Rory twice a week. Like he's a totally different kid now. And it stinks that I can't see a lot of my other friends in person who were initially in my circle, but we made that decision for his social benefit and it's paid off. Yeah. Like that's a phenomenal answer, right? Like what can you do for your child's socialization? Because that is a huge, huge, huge piece of keeping your kids developmentally on track to meeting your kids' social emotional needs. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of really great things that come out of kids being able to socialize with other kids. Um, so it really just comes down to what is your comfort level, right? With your child being around other, other, another child or other children. Um, and maybe that's just family members, right? Like maybe you're actually okay with your circle being your family, because maybe you have siblings who have young kids too right? Like for some people, that's a really good option. Maybe it is finding that one person in your circle who like your kid gets along with really well and you trust, and you can have this conversation around like what we're comfortable with taking on and what we're comfortable, like kind of giving up right now for the benefit of ourselves and also for the benefit of our child. Right? So it really does come back to like, how can you meet, what, is, what, are, what are the benefits for your child? How can you meet those needs and do it in the safest way possible? And it's going to look a little bit different for everybody, right? But like the example that Caitlin just gave is such a good example, right? You, with every decision that you make, you are going to be giving something up, but you're giving it up knowing that the benefits for your child, the benefits for you, the benefit for your overall family unit far outweighs the, the a little bit of risk that you're going to take on and also the things that you may have to give up in order to make that happen. Such a good example, Caitlin. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um... I wanna answer one more question because the other ones I actually have already covered, but there's one outstanding one and that is deciding when to get pregnant. Um, hospital safety, education, things like that. So you guys, there's always going to be a reason why it's not the perfect time to do anything, including getting pregnant, right? Um, and I, I've actually had this conversation with like some of the nurses who work for us, who in particular, one nurse was like flat out told by her midwife in, maybe May, not to get pregnant right now, that it was not safe for her to get pregnant. And it was like, ooh, like I can understand why people might have that stance, but it's also like, that's a hard thing to like state as like a fact, right? Like there's, you know, there's always a reason why it might not be a good time to get pregnant. Um, you may have been trying to get pregnant for a long time and you don't really want to wait, right? Um, I think that the decision needs to come down to Again, anytime that you're gonna that that you get pregnant, it's not gonna come without zero risk, right? There's always some risk associated with everything that we're doing. How can you make this this decision knowing that this is the best decision for you and your family right now? And that if you it did get pregnant, how are you going to mitigate the risk, right? Um, obviously, there are a lot of people who are pregnant right now in the pandemic, and so um, so you do need to be. Don't get me wrong; I'm not saying don't think about. The risks, right? But but again, I want you to think about it in the context of, well, there's there's these inherent risks that that we're always willing to take on that aren't on the forefront of our minds, and that does include risks that you're taking on at any time to get pregnant. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily tell people like, don't get pregnant right now because, you know, it's really risky. Um, I would just make sure that you're making that decision um, because you feel like that is the best thing for you and your family right now. And, and knowing that, you know, you can come up with a million reasons why anything is not, it's, you know, it's not the perfect time, but you can't wait for the perfect time, right? Um, Stacy, you have a question. I have a two week old. We're staying with my parents for Thanksgiving in New Hampshire. Do you recommend we get COVID tests? All visits so far, we have all worn masks. Um, COVID tests, so you're going, sorry, Stacy, can you just clarify you're yep. going to New Hampshire? Yes, I was going to go, we're going to go stay with my parents. And so far, all of our um, visits, they've come here and we've all worn masks and washed hands. But since we're going to be staying with them, um, I didn't know if you recommend we all get tested so that we could feel a little more relaxed about masks and in yeah. the house. Yeah. So again, I, like this is a, this is a scenario where it could go either way. 
Um, you could get tested if you want it for your own peace of mind, for your parents' peace of mind. I would have the conversation with your parents. Do they actually want you getting tested? Would they feel more comfortable? Um, I, you don't you don't need to get your two week old tested. You know, I think it's safe to make the assumption that if you're negative, then your two week old is negative. Um, so so definitely don't feel like if that's the deciding factor of like I don't want my newborn getting tested, you don't need to get your newborn tested. I feel pretty strongly about that. Um, but yeah, like I think it's just a decision of like well you know, what do you sort of feel like, what things have you done that you feel like were sort of risky, right? Like how much have you actually like taken on as a risk? Has it been a lot of visitors? You know, how, did they wash their hands? Um, sort of what activities have they partaken in? Like, but if you feel like, um, you know, if you feel like that you're, you, you haven't really engaged in any risky behavior. Like, I feel like talking about this, it feels like when I say things like that, I'm like, I feel like I'm talking about sex with people. Um, but if you feel like you haven't engaged in any risky behavior, you know, you really haven't like gone anywhere. Um, you, you know, there's, there's nobody who you've come in contact with that has been positive. If your parents don't feel strongly about you getting tested, you don't have to, but if you want to do it for a peace of mind, you certainly can. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is awesome. Catherine said, I'm an OBGYN and I second that advice on pregnancy timing. We are not counseling our patients to not get pregnant right now. I so appreciate that, Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, any other questions, you guys? Before I jump off. Okay, so resources you guys want me to share. Emily Oster, um, Courtney at Pearl Plates. Anything else that I mentioned? No? I mean, I know some of you guys, um, are pregnant, I'm like more than happy uh, to send you some information about like some of our prenatal offerings. All of our classes right now are virtual. Um, so if you're looking for any type of education, then happy to like provide you with that information, no problem. Um, so I'm happy to provide you with that information or information. I know some of you also have newborns um, or for the pregnant people too. If you guys want any information about like our lactation visits or mom's groups, um, Caitlin, we actually have a veterans mom's group now too which I ran the are, last Are you week. guys doing in-person lactation visits? We are doing in-person lactation visits. Yep. Um, in-person or virtual, we give people the option, but yeah, and we, we're screening everybody too. Um, so, so yeah, so in-person lactation, um, virtual prenatal classes, um, and virtual mom's groups. So I can send you guys that information too, if that's of interest to anybody as well. All right. Guys, this was awesome. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie, for coming. I hope that you guys got as much out of this as I, I hope that you did. <laughs> but you guys were super Thank interactive. You. It was so fun. I really, really, really appreciate you guys showing up tonight and, and bringing all your questions. This was really fun. Thank you so much, Jamie. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, you guys. It was so great to see you all. And have a good night. Thank nice you. Day. Bye. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Sam. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Good night. Yeah, I'll just follow up to you with me. an email with, yeah. Perfect. All right, yeah, perfect. That would be awesome, and I'll share it with All everyone right. else. Cool. All right, sounds good. Bye, have a good All night. Right,